They have him in his prison house. They have searched his person and left no prying instrument with him. One after another, they have closed the heavy iron doors upon him. And now they have him, as it were, bolted in with a lock of a hundred keys, which can never be unlocked without the concurrence of every key. The keys in the hands of a hundred different men and they scattered to a hundred different and distant places, and they stand musing as to what invention, in all the dominions of mind and matter, can be produced to make the impossibility of his escape more complete than it is. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves, and under a just God cannot long retain it. If slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong.
My name is Henry Fort, and I died a free man in 1876. The federal census of 1870 said I can neither read nor write, but I'm not an ignorant man. Slaves weren't supposed to have book learning, and I was a slave of Master William Lilly Fort. Those are my slave headquarters down near White Oak Creek. The census said that Master Williams was a builder. I was a builder too, and I could build most anything made out of wood. Whatever I built, it was pretty. Now when the Yankees came, the, the whole earth turned blue. The Yankees were thick as flies on a two-day dead hog. One slave lady, she said, well, I've been praying long enough and now they're here. We prayed a lot in the slave days. We had prayer meetings, and we went up to the white folks' church. Now, white folks, they sat on the other side of the railing, but we could still hear the preacher preach. He'd preach to us to obey our masters. One time, he said that he knew that the North was on the side, or the Lord was on the side of the North because they was peaceful folk. He said that the North invaded the South. He said that people should be free to leave the Union. I just thought all people should be free. Miss Jenny, my wife, and I wanted to be free. I was a slave. The law said that I was less than human. I was like property, like a horse, a cow. The law said that a master could sell a man's wife and his children. But I remember that day changed. The day freedom came, it came riding in on a blue streak of lightning with the thunder of clouds and the crying of a new life. Well, on Sundays, our help would fill our table to overflowing. There were eight of us children, and we would go outside and play with my cousins, now quietly, of course, because it was Sunday. And then that awful war came. Why, four of my brothers marched off so brave and so excited to the war. And, and three of them, three, got killed far, far from my home. Why, my, my sister Sandal's husband got killed way over in Goldsboro, and it left two of her precious little boys without a father. I had been married about two years when my very own husband decided to join that war. He marched out my front door and I never saw him again. He was 26 years old. We heard that he had been captured and they were holding him at the Fort Delaware prison. And that is where he caught the smallpox. Well, the Yankees decided that they would trade him so that they would not get sick with the Union prisoner. And I will tell you, by that time, he was too ill to come home, and I had absolutely no way to get to him. You know, he died in the Potts Hospital in Richmond, all by himself. I don't even know whether he fired the very first shot in that war. I don't know if he suffered. I don't know if there was anybody there to hold his hand when he died. I, I really don't even know where the buried him. All I do know is that that war changed everything for me. I had to raise my nine-month-old son all by myself. I had to move back in with my mama and my daddy, and I never got remarried. You know, Sundays, Sundays were always the happiest of days at our house until the war. And after that, they became the very, very loneliest. We shall meet
As we lay on the ground before an assault in Malvern Hill, a startled rabbit dashed amidst the exploding shells and bullets. I called out loud enough for my men to hear, run little cottontail. I'd run too if I wasn't governor of North Carolina. I was Zebulon B. Vance, North Carolina's governor throughout much of the war. It was my duty to fight. I would have preferred to stay with my men in the field, but was assured that my service was needed in Raleigh as governor. I did all I could to keep North Carolina out of the war. We must not leave the union of our fathers, I said. But on April 12, 1861, four years to the day of our peace train, Fort Sumter, South Carolina was fired upon. President Lincoln requested troops to fight our neighbors. We could not do that. My change was so sudden, it was as if I raised my hand a unionist and dropped it a secessionist. The War of Independence was a revolution of the politician, not of the people. The great popular heart was not ever in the war, but more than 620,000 men died because we politicians could not prevent war. There is no honor in that. I tried all I could to supply troops and comfort their families, but by April 12, 1865, 89,000 Yankees were near Smithfield, and the 7,000 people of Raleigh were left unprotected. My advisors pleaded with me to pull North Carolina troops from the war to save lives and to prevent more hardships on our women and children. The year before, when the Peace Party sought to end the war, my plan, if not reelected, was to join the Army and be killed. There is no honor in surrender. I was not a coward. I was no jackrabbit. Personally, I was willing to fight to my last breath. I sent a peace train to General Sherman because our boys in the field said, they don't fear Yankee lead, but they worried always for their wives and children. They begged me to protect their families. How could I submit our defenseless and suffering women to the devastation that awaited them if I took no action? Is it better for a besieged fortress to come to terms or to hold out and be put to the sword on a false sense of honor? I sought peace, even if it brought me personal dishonor. It was not General Sherman's orders that all those buildings be burned, but a mischievous hand applies a building to one of the, that hand applies a torch to one of the buildings not burned by his orders, and thus an entire city is destroyed. I cannot say I like to have seen it, but all I have to say is, so may it have been to the whole Southern Confederacy. We didn't start this war. In the midst of peace and prosperity, they plunged the nation into war, dark war, cruel war. They dared us into battle, insulted our flag, seized our forts and arsenals. If people should raise a howl against my barbarity or my cruelty, I will say that war is war and not popularity seeking. I was 19 years old and living in Christian Hollow, Illinois, when I enlisted in the 92nd Illinois Volunteers. I assure you I did not leave the wheat field with their ripening crops for the $50 bounty, nor the $13 a month salary. No, I believe the U.S. Constitution was the best hope for the world. I took a solemn oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I was duty bound by my country. And I hated slavery. You talk of hardships and empty chairs. Imagine having your husband, wife, brother, sister taken and sold. Children stripped from their mother's arms at a master's whim. One of my dying countrymen said, my life my life is part of the price of freedom. Cheerfully I die. So say we all. We fought for freedom and to preserve the Union. Our cause was just. And the more horrible we made the war, the, the quicker it would end. We did exact a terrible toll in South Carolina. <laughs> its people were early and ardent advocates of secession. And they reaped the fruits of their industry. But had it been my native state, I would not have laid down arms until every one of the brigands had been bushwhacked or I had been killed. War is horrible, and horrible things are done by men, good men, God-fearing men, men who attended services with me. By April 12, 1865, we had received orders to stop the burnings. We, we had received similar orders in the past, but this time, this time it was different. 
We were not far from Raleigh when an officer, a general no less, he rode up and said the war was almost over. There was no need for more burnings. He dismounted and joined an old farmer and I to help extinguish the flames. I started to feel a little more human that day. For the first time in four years, I thought I might become a normal man one day. And I was. Later, a rancher, a farmer, and a hardware store manager. Oh, life is funny. I was never wounded in battle, but while splitting wood back at home, the axe slipped and I cut off my foot. What rebel bullets didn't do, I, I did to myself. I was Oscar Ripley Rand, an attorney, planter and Wake County native. My family has lived in this area for generations, dating back to colonial times. My father was Nathaniel Green Rand. Uh, he was named for the general my grandfather served with during the Revolutionary War. So you could say my family's roots run deep in this soil. When North Carolina seceded from the Union, I, as did many of my friends and neighbors, volunteered for our state's call to defend her against the invaders. I was 28 years old when I bade my wife Sarah and our three young children farewell, and I enlisted in the Army as a private. I helped enlist other men across the county, and together we formed a volunteer infantry company called the Wake Guards. The men elected me as their captain, and together we were mustered into Confederate service as Company D of the 26th North Carolina Infantry, commanded by then Colonel Zebulon Vance. While fighting at the Battle of Newburn, I was captured, and I spent six months as a Union prisoner of war. My health suffered greatly during that time, but I was fortunate to be included in a prisoner exchange and I was allowed to return home to my family to convalesce. It was at home during the summer of 1863 that we learned the news of General Lee's second to Great Northern Campaign, which <coughs> culminated in the Battle of Gettysburg. <coughs> With Lee's army was my old regiment, the 26th. Going into that battle, they numbered some 800 men. But by the end of the first day's fighting, they had suffered some 588 casualties. By the end of the third day, the last day, there were only about 70 men left to answer the muster roll. Our community suffered other devastating <coughs> hardships during this war. The Auburn Guards, Company D of the 31st North Carolina, was reduced to 60 men during the fighting at Petersburg. 21 of our community's gallant sons that perished under the 31st banner. You know, a lot of people once said that this wouldn't be much of a war, that we'd whip the Yankees handily. My neighbor, Joe Walton, once said that we'd get up in the morning, go whip the North, and be home in time for supper. <laughs> well, that table's been set for four years now, There'll be a lot of empty chairs before it's over. I fought the Yankees. I had been their prisoner. I had seen them kill my friends, friends who I had helped recruit to fight in the cause for our new nation. Some years after the war, I was offered an important job in Washington, D.C., but I would have none of it. My reply to the offer was, offer was as sharp as a musket volley. Join the Yankees? Never. And I'll say it again, never. It was my high honor and privilege to have served with the men of this great state, men who were first at Bethel, farthest to the front at Gettysburg, last at Appomattox. 
You know, perhaps General Robert E. Lee paid North Carolina the highest tribute when he said, God bless the Tar Heel boys. best friend's head as he died here on April 12, 1865. I'd been in more than 130 engagements, which claimed the lives of over 100,000 men, but none of those deaths could prepare me for the passing of Lieutenant Thomas Jordan Donahue. Tom was from Clark County, Georgia, and he'd attended Yale University. He was a cavalry man, just like me. He was the best man I knew. He once saved my life, literally throwing me on his back and dragging me off the battlefield when I was just too weak to walk. But I could not save his, or my friend Richard Eustace. 
We were trying to slow the Yankees here at Swift Creek, and I knew the fight would be a difficult one. As was my habit, I prayed a fervent prayer to the most powerful and, and glorious Lord God. I, I asked him to come and, and take the cause into his hand and, and judge between us and, and our enemy. Stir up thy strength, O Lord, and come and help us. For thou givest not always the battle to the strong. I did not pray to live. I knew the Yankees read the same Bible we did, and their mother or wife probably gave it to them. And I knew they were praying. I'd seen many a young boy on both sides pray to live before they died. When it was your time to go, you are summoned. We had the Yankees here at Swift Creek, and they were brandishing seven-shot Spencer rifles. You could load one of them on a Sunday and shoot all week. It seemed so, anyway. We attacked with sabers, and I thought we would rule the day. We had stopped them. But just then, their band struck up Hail Columbia, and they began to fight and cheer like cornered bears. It was one of the hottest encounters of the war. The enemy advanced in great numbers, rushing like a torrent, but the Spencers filled the air with lead, but we were steady until ordered to mount up and pull back. As we descended into the road, it was like plunging into the jaws of death. The air was just buzzing with bullets, and the Yankees were rushing along close to us. Tom, he, he stayed up on the road, and I set off for the bushes. I rode on a ways and through the brush. It didn't take me long until I came across Tom. Just lying there on the ground. I stopped. I raised his head in my lap. His horse and mine still standing there as he gasped his last breath. The blood from his bosom bespattered the picture of his little motherless daughter. His wife had died giving birth to that little girl. Tom, he, he named her Amanda Jane, and they called her Katie. Tom left his baby girl with the sister come and join a fight for our new country. From that day at Swift Creek, Katie never wanted for anything that I could not provide. I'd failed her father, but I would not fail her. Services for Tom were held at Christ Episcopal Church later that afternoon. They buried him in a blanket. There was no wood for a coffin. I buried Tom and Lieutenant Metcalf in the same grave. I, d I don't know where my friend Richard Eustace is buried. He was the best and bravest soldier in the Confederacy. He was at Harvard University when his brother, a Harvard professor and a Union general, asked him to join the cause. Richard instead chose us. Families were torn apart all over this country.
gentle or your kind. It don't think of the folks behind. There on a beautiful morning. Two girls waiting by the railroad track. Two girls waiting by the railroad track. For their darlings to come back. We didn't know the name of the boy they brought to our house. We just knew that somewhere he must have a mother, brothers, perhaps a wife, someone who cared for him. This war was hard on us women. We labored in the fields with the littlest of children, all just to grow crops. There were food shortages everywhere. You money? Our money was essentially worthless. Flour, why it cost a thousand dollars a barrel confederate, if you could find any flour. But I always kept in the back of my mind that our hardships must be nothing compared to what those boys faced every day on those battlefields. We simply hoped that if one of our hometown boys needed help, that maybe there was a, a family near their battle that might help them too. But when they brought that wounded boy to our home, his comrades, they got him up those narrow stairs to the attic space that we had there. and We tried to make him as comfortable as we could, for a wounded man anyway. I did my best to nurse him every way I knew how. But it was to no avail. The day he died, well, us women there on, on our own, we couldn't get him past that crook in the stairs laid out as he was, so we had to fashion a way to lower him from the window. We had to give him a suitable burial. He was an honorable soldier. We found a nice little place for him just over in the Michener Cemetery. He lies there beneath that tombstone for an unknown but very loved soldier.
Dallas T. Ward. I was the conductor on the so-called peace train. I was 19 years old. And on April 12, 1865, I got word to head on back down to the roundhouse that we were going to put together this train to carry a delegation to meet with General Sherman about sparing the city of Raleigh. Well, when the Confederate boys heard about it, well, they started calling us cowards and blue bellies and traitors. But I fashioned up a, a white flag of peace and opened up all the windows and, and the two governors, the old men, Swain and Graham, they got on board. And I could tell from their expression that it was a sad day for North Carolina and for the Confederacy. Anyway, we, we got the train going and we were moving on down the tracks of two or three miles and next thing you know, here comes Wade Hampton and the Confederate cavalry. Well, when he found out what we were up to, he wasn't none too happy. But he let us proceed on down the road, but he told us that we might not make it, that there was a Yankee army on the way. Well, we got on down the road a couple more miles, and next thing you know, he rode back on us. And he said we had to go back to Raleigh. So we put the train in reverse and started going back to Raleigh. Well, sure enough, those Yankees, they fought their way up from Swift Creek, and they got all the way to the railroad tracks. Man, they descended on us like a bunch of wild Indians. I thought they were going to kill every one of us. <laughs> Even though we had that flag of truce and, and we didn't have any arms. Well, they took the two old governors off the train. They put them on a carriage. Undoubtedly, it was stolen. And they carried him back down to meet with General Kilpatrick. I stayed back with the train. And the next thing you know, them Yankees, they just started in on me. It was just one insult right after another. And I'll give it right back to him. Until one of them stuck a loaded musket right between my eyes and I thought it might be best to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Did you know those guys took $220, Confederate money, off of me <laughs> and my gold pocket watch? I just got this old one now. And then, they told me it was my turn to go down there and see General Kilpatrick. So we went back down in the woods and I could hear the cannon fire in the background and the rifles going off and, and the musket balls were plucking in the trees. And as soon as I got down there, he was just a cussing. He was cussing up a storm. You know, he might have been the best cusser that I ever heard. <laughs> Well, he started asking me all these questions about the, the defenses of Raleigh and the federal troops. Now, do you think I told him anything? Well, you darn right I did. <laughs> and then after a while, he, he let me go back to the train, and then they brought the, the two governors back, and we started out down the track down to what was called Gully Station. I think y'all know what it is, Clayton, North Carolina now. But this time when we got on the train, yeah, I guess there was a hundred Yankees on board. And there was a whole lot more of them in the woods and, and in the fields. And they were just a cheering because they had heard that, that Lee had surrendered and Richmond had fallen. I guess they figured that we were there to surrender an army. And in some ways, they were right. Let me tell you a little bit more about this peace train. I'm David L. Swain, a former governor of North Carolina and the president of the University of North Carolina on April the 12th, 1865. My family has served the state of North Carolina since before the Revolutionary War. And I was governor of North Carolina in 1831 when the old state capitol building burned but I feared that conflagration would be nothing compared to what the Yankees were about to unleash upon us. 
I feared all the progress our state had made. Our schools, our museums, our textiles, our railroads, even our new state capitol building was all about to be laid to ruin. Now there is no doubt General Sherman was a vandal and authorized the ravaging of the South. But unlike General Kilpatrick, who was a compound brute and braggart, Sherman was most gracious to us and assured us that we were not his prisoners. After negotiations, he promised that Raleigh and Chapel Hill would not be burned as long as there was no resistance. Now he doubted the feasibility of an immediate suspension of hostilities, but said he would do all in his power to see that the conflict was brought to a quick end. He did insist, however, that we remain there in his headquarters camp overnight, rather than try to return to Raleigh in the dark through jumpy troops, and that would have been fine except Governor Vance had expected us back in Raleigh by four o'clock that afternoon. And he had been told that we'd been taken prisoner. So when Joe Wheeler's cavalry entered Raleigh, Governor Vance abandoned it. And the plundering started in earnest. All the burning, all the looting, all the stealing, all the things that General Sherman said his men wouldn't do, our men did. God save us from our retreating friend as well as our advancing foe. Now, the next morning, General Kilpatrick stopped our train and said that even if one shot was fired in resistance, Raleigh would pay. You see, Kilpatrick had requested the honor of receiving Raleigh's surrender, that honor could have cost him his life. My wife, I love her. I done something stupid. I got myself hung in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, they buried me there. Leg poking out of the ground like some young cottonwood tree. Hadn't been for the Raleigh ladies who begged, they would have left me there. Oh, yeah. No dead laying there waiting for some mongrel to come and clean the bone. Now, I didn't hurt nobody that day. April 13th, 1865. Yeah, I, I, I reckon they were just looking to set an example. I sure gave them an excuse to string somebody up that day. <laughs> I told them my name was Lieutenant Robert Walsh. Now, you ain't gonna find nobody with that name on record serving in the Texas Cavalry. No, I served on a fighting Joe Wheeler's command with the Rear guard in Raleigh, protecting the city from vandals. Now, the Yankees and everybody, they had, they had already left. The governor, now he had already left, and the Yankees said we were looters and plunderers. I mean, there weren't no shopkeepers around? No. And the Yankees, they were gonna rob them blind before they burned them to the ground. We just figured we needed a few camp comforts know as, as much as the Yankees did. Nobody said we wouldn't put up a fight. Oh, we was pretty good in a scrap. Now when the Yankees appeared down yonder in the Fayetteville Street, all the men with me just mounted up and rode away. But, but I waited. Oh, I waited. Nobody was ever going to say Raleigh was surrendered without a shot being fired. I waited till I could see the Yankees' eyes. Oh, and they're shining new ponchos in the rain. <laughs> well, I reached for my pistol and pulled it out, and I said, Hooray for the Confederacy! And fired off six shots! Now, Governor Swain later said it was a good thing I had missed, because had I hit one, the whole army would have destroyed the city. 
Well, I mean, I was fighting the war. Well, I tried getting away. Roads being slick, my horse slipped. They caught me. Took me to Yankee General Hugh Judson Kilpatrick, who said, blah, 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 blah. that's the way he talked to me. Blah, 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 blah. Boy, now, why did you fire at us? And I said, well, <clears throat> well, I hate Yankees, and I'd like to see a whole pile of you dead. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Now that got old redhead's dander up. And he said, that's it. Take him out of the side of ladies and string him up. Well, when I found out he was gonna hang me, I said, well, thank you, kind sir. And I laughed all the way to the hanging tree. <laughs> now some people said I was drunk, but I won't. You see, it was a relief to know it was about to all be over. I mean, a mind can only take so much. The shooting and dying, the cannons booming, the bullets whistling, and the carnage. Men's arms and legs being blown off. You'd be riding, you see a cannon, you look like it's pointed right down your throat. It just gets to be too much. You see, the dying wasn't the hard part. It was the living. Well, but like this, I said, they, they, they buried me there, but that wasn't my final resting spot, you know, because my, my leg poking out of the ground. So the ladies begged, and they had me dug up and buried again, so they removed my remains and moved them to the Rock Quarry Cemetery. No, later they took me and they moved me to the Oakwood Cemetery. Oh, I should have never left Texas. A man can't even rest in peace. Lieutenant <laughs> Walsh, you definitely shouldn't have left Texas. Just like I shouldn't have trusted those darn Yankees. They owe me money to this day. In fact, I had to take them to court. I remember the day I took them to court. I walked up to that judge. I said, may it please the court, your honor. I was promised payment by the men of Union Captain R.M.A. Hawk of Illinois. And I was a union man, always had been. In fact, I said to that Judge Yana, Oscar Rand, he even threatened me one time, saying that when the South was an independent state, he would see it to those who hadn't helped the cause. <laughs> well, I said to that judge, I said, Judge, my place is down near Hayes Chapel Church, and it still bears the bullet holes from the skirmishing down there and the wear and tear from the Union forces using my house as a makeshift hospital. And I said, Your Honor, the Union forces, they transported their wounded in my carriage using my horse. They took my lumber to bury their dead. Your Honor, they took 20 bushels of my corn, five slabs of my 40-pound bait, 20 gallons of my sorghum, nine buckets of my peas, and two of my saddles. I said to that judge, I said, Your Honor, I never took an oath to the Confederacy, nor did I get paid the money I was owed by those darn Yankees. The Yankees owed me $655. And I said, Judge, Judge, you know, I was the county magistrate, and I know the law. The United States owes me to this very day. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I was a free man when I first came to Raleigh with the Yankees. And I was, I came of my own free will. I was walking tall and proud. Negro men didn't know about pride in them days. It's funny, I started out the war with the Southern Army. I was a servant, mm-hmm, I was a servant 
for my master's son. There was a big fight. White man came and told me my master was gone. I don't know, dead, what, I don't know. He was gone. And I was supposed to go down and work on the fortress. Well, I worked on the fortress. Day and night, all kinds of weather. And I never saw no payment for it. I stayed there three years, uh-huh, three years, eight months. Then there was this other big battle. Yankees took it then. They took the place. I wasn't no fool. I went to work for the Yankees. Hmm. They told me. They told me that the Yankees would treat me mean. And blow up the lights. <laughs> And they did. <laughs> but knowing how Negroes were going to be in the future, we got light. <laughs> oh. Now I want to tell you about working for the Yankees. They said it would be me, to me. But they gave me clothes, huh? They gave me clothes and shoes. Shoes! They gave me something to eat. And most of all, they paid me for my work. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you this. They had a whole big bunch of colored men like me in their army. And the only thing I can say about these men was, ha! Ah, they were sharp. Pretty soon, we was going down this road, coming back to Robin. Oh. I was working for the United States of America. Mm -hmm. They told me to gather up all the chickens and the hogs. All of them, just take them from people. Well, we might as well. Wheeler's men had already come through, got all the silver. But we got the chickens and the hogs. All of them. Now look up there. Look up there. You see that weather vane on the top of Christ Church? When we came here, they said that was the only bird left in town. <laughs> Still up there to this day. Mm, mm, mm. The Yankees, well, the Yankees would, would skin the chickens and the geese. And they chop up the hogs and the cows. And they only use part of it. They skin the hogs and the, and, and the pigs too. They only used part of what they cut up. They used just part of the cow. Mostly just the hind quarter. 
And what I never understood is they left the rest of it. They left the rest of it to rot. Woo! It made such a stink. Now I'm gonna tell you, I was there, I know, I saw it with my own two eyes. I saw what the Yankees did. Yes. Yankees did things for just for meanness. They would bust open a barrel. They bust open a barrel of molasses. They take feathers from pillows, mattress, wherever they could find them. They would soak it all up and then they would scatter it all over the place. <sighs> they, they broke all the windows. That is, if they did just burn the place down. Generally, generally, the Yankees killed everything except for the people and the rats. I think the rats had them outnumbered. Now, Listen up. I know what it is to be poor. You hear me? I know what it is. I was poor. And I felt sorry for them people. I felt really sorry for them. We went to a place. We went to a place and There was a, a white woman, a white woman who had only one piece of meat, one measly piece of meat, and a whole bunch, a whole bunch of hungry little chilling. I begged the Yankees. Yes, I did. I begged them. Leave that little piece of meat alone. She was so poor. But the officer, oh, the officer, the officer said, no, take that piece of meat. And they did. They took it. Oh. Excuse me, Miss Lady. Excuse me. I'm very sorry. After the surrender, I asked my mama if we had lost. She said no, that we had won, because my papa was coming home. I've looked at a heap of Yankees, but I haven't seen the ones with the horns yet. closed our curtains on April 16, 1865, on Easter morning, when the United States flag was hoisted at St. Mary's School for Girls. We attended chapel for the first time since the arrival of our enemy, and seven Yankee officers came in. They treated us with the greatest kindness and respect. That evening, more than 200 of their men came to services. The General Howard is a Methodist preacher. Imagine a minister among those I consider to be devils. The service commenced with a hymn. It, it was perfectly exquisite. Nothing could have been more beautiful. How did that go? Safe in the arms of Jesus. Safe on his gentle.
inflicted so much pain and hardship on our people, talked about loving our fellow man. He said he had no personal resentment for the South. He called us his countrymen and said we had fought him hard for a cause, but that the North had won. He said he had no hatred for his former enemy. I can't say I do hate Yankees, but it was a nice sermon and I often ponder what he said. He said that God had been on the side of the North. The North had won, he said, because of God's providence and his love for all men, even slaves. The ground at the cross is level, he said, and none is higher than another. We are all sinners in need of a Savior, the Savior Jesus Christ. Is it possible God was on the side of the Yankees? Well, one day we all went up to Capitol Square and we watched as the Yankees marched past for hours. How did our little band of boys fight for so long against so many? One of the Yankees tried to court me there. He came up and asked what I thought of the troops. I told him it was the largest, most perfectly drilled, disciplined, and equipped army of the modern days. But I asked him if the United States had supplied all those silver cups I saw among the soldiers. He said they came from home. So I inquired from whose home were they stolen from. <laughs> he puffed up and asked why seven women acted so silly. I told him I didn't know unless it was from a sincere desire to render ourselves suitable for the gentlemen of the United States Army. When he said that this is the most God-forsaken place on earth, I told him he was correct. But what would one expect? The devil took possession over this land and has not let go of his hold on it for one instant since the Yankees have been here. every night when I tried to sleep. When I died in 1917, they wrote that I didn't have an enemy on this earth. But for four years, I fought my enemy. I joined the Confederate Army when I was just 18 years old. And after those four years, I had scars on the outside that other folks could see. The scars on the inside that only I knew about. I couldn't talk about them to the ones I loved most in the world. I saw my friends killed and maimed. I thought surely I would perish. God forgive me. There were times when I prayed that I would. See, I was there at the siege of Petersburg. I survived the horror of the Battle of the Crater. We slaughtered hundreds of Yankee soldiers, caught their own trap. Sometimes at night, I can still hear them scream. And later on, I was captured. Survived only at the mercy of my enemies. You can't imagine the dream, the nightmares I had when I could sleep. I saw wagon loads of discarded arms and, and legs. I saw no colors of blue butternut, just carnage, and you know the worst of it, after all those years of fighting and suffering and dying, it was all in vain, but I tried to do what our president, Jefferson Davis, told us, 
I kept his words with me always. He said, the past is dead. Let it bury its dead, its hopes, and its aspirations. Before you lies the future, a future full of gold and promise, a future of expanding national glory before which all the world shall stand amazed. Let me beseech you to lay aside all rancor, all bitter sectional feeling, and to take your places in the ranks of those who will bring about a consummation devoutly to be prayed for, a reunited country. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. I harbored no hatred for my former enemies. I felt no need for revenge. I felt only regret and sorrow. I tried to let go of the war, but the war wouldn't let go of me. I could find no peace. So I came home and I built. I built this house here with my own hands. It still stands today. You can still read my weathered tombstone over there. They rode on it. Sleep, sleep at last. Thy sleep shall be thy rest, thy strength, thy victory. train accomplished this mission of peace. Raleigh was not burned, nor was Chapel Hill, even after the Union troops were told that their President Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. Within a few days of Raleigh's surrender, Joe Johnson surrendered his Confederate force and the war was over. The heart of the state had been spared uh, from General Sherman's total war. Ellen Poole Harrison's son grew, out, grew up without a father, but he went on to serve in the North Carolina State House of Representatives and was elected sheriff of Wake County. William Body went back to Christian Hollow, Illinois. He married Anna Eliza Meeker. They had 10 children. And at age 70, he collected a $24 per month pension for his time in the Union Army. Oscar Ripley ran, moved to Johnson County, and continued his law practice. Edwin Vance was arrested and held prisoner in Washington, D.C., though he was never charged with a criminal offense. He went on to serve in the United States Senate and is one of North Carolina's revered governors. I have always been proud because they advanced my friend. Little Katie Donahue was raised by Tom Donahue's sister with the financial assistance of his old rebel compatriot. George Rogers stayed with the Union Army and accompanied them down to Florida, then out to Texas, where he became a cowboy. Several years later, he came back to Wake, uh, Wake County saying, I've seen enough cows. <laughs> St. Mary's is still in operation, and I understand the girls over there are still flirting. <laughs> Union General Smith D. Atkins, who fought down at Swift Creek and uh, stopped the peace train, led the occupying forces into Chapel Hill. And on Easter Sunday of 1865, he met my daughter, Anna, in my living room. Four months later, they were married in my backyard. 
that marriage caused such an outrage that my daughter and I were burned in effigy. And I was removed as president of the University of North Carolina. It's written that a short time later I died of a broken heart. After the Confederacy surrendered and the war was effectively over, a Union signal officer stationed up on top of the state capitol building began to fire off signal rockets. One of the rockets exploded in his face, but despite the burns and the pain, he continued to send his message out across the sky. Peace on earth goodwill to men. for a while after the war, but on December 23rd, 1874, I paid Mr. Eli Dupree $1,040 for 52.25 acres down near Hayes Chapel Church. I own my own business here making furniture. They say my furniture eventually ended up in the North Carolina Museum, Museum of History. I was a human being. I was a free man and I died a free man. 